Test one, is this coming through here or there? Okay. All right. We got some awards to give out tonight. You can tell school's about to be over. That sounds better, whatever you just did. There you go. All right. I think we have a, a lady in our church who is graduating tonight, Jennifer Tuggle. She is uh, graduating from hair school, so if you guys need your hair done, here you go. Some of you men might want to go to her. Amen. Only if she can do miracles, Wayne. Miracles. <laughs> right, Tom. She can do all things through Christ. Amen. All right, we've got three young women that we're going to recognize tonight. First one, Certificate of Achievement awarded to this girl for K-Prep test effort, Cynthia Needham. <laughs> Citizenship Certificate bestowed to, I can't believe this one, this girl for outstanding behavior. Just the last name kind of de defeats that. Anyway, <laughs> Zoe Needham. Zoe, come on. <laughs> She's probably not related to Vicky if she got that award. Amen. So. All right. Out of this world, map progress, certificate and drama. This is one legit certificate right here for this person. Drama queen. <laughs> Student Council Certificate, Outstanding Effort. And all these go to Lily Needham. You ever seen her act out? Now that's Vicky's daughter right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. We got smart people around here. We do have some kids that are going to be graduating from high school this year, so the church will be giving them a little piece of money because we like to help them celebrate their graduation. Amen. Uh, Todd, tell them what's going on Saturday. Amen. There it is. Corn show. <laughs> I told Norman as soon as he walked in, I said he's going. First thing out of his mouth is going to be the picnic on Saturday, and I was right. So he's excited about the picnic. What time is everything starting on Saturday? Where's the bosses? Starts at noon, but we're eating at two. I'm not in charge, thank God. Somebody else is. So we're starting at noon, eating at 2. If you're coming down and you need directions, they're out there on the glass case. We will have fun. <sighs> you're supposed to bring two side dishes and two liters with you when you come. See, I just asked for somebody to tell me what was going on, and it's being fed to me back here. So two liters and side dishes for this Saturday. And bring some people with you. We'll just have some fun. Tom and Tessie said, you know, the house is ours. We can do with it whatever we want to. Right, Tom? All right. Uh, we do have the paintball guns we're bringing down. I'm going to try to rent some more. So if you guys are up for paintball, let's have some fun. If you parents want to shoot a child, we'll take you into the woods, and whatever happens in the woods stays in the woods, right? Amen. So if you're ready to have church, let's all stand. I know um, Paul and the East Step clan are not here tonight because Jessica is being awarded for her smarts in school. So She doesn't get it from Paul. No. Wow. Oh, man. This is a loving church, isn't it? <laughs> Haven't you picked up on it yet? It's so loving. Um, pick on everybody. You have to be tough to come to the mission. I've already figured Amen. that out. If you're thin-skinned, game over. Find game over. Let's pray and invite the good Lord into the service. I, I'm already hearing the music, and I'm already getting excited. I love bass. I love drums. I love piano. So let's just pray and invite the Lord in. Let's have a great worship service and good service all together. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, God, thanking you for this chance to be in your house one more time. Father, we thank you for your wonderful blessings. Thank you for a good week. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do in, our, in your house here tonight, Lord. Bless each and every part of this service, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Remain standing if you can. Amen. Forward. She listens to Wayne. Are you glad to be in God's house tonight? Now I'll tell you what, Monday and Tuesday, 
I was over in Cincinnati at a black church, and I'm telling you what, them people know how to worship. I mean, they even got me dancing, so you know it had to be God. So tonight, I don't see very many that's that color, but I hope you got that soul in you tonight. Because the same spirit that works over there is the same spirit that works here. I want to see you get with it tonight. Amen? How many came to worship? How many came to praise the name of the Lord? Paul's not here tonight. you got to suffer me. And you got a good band back here. So I think we can do this tonight. We're going to do some easy songs. Everybody ought to know. So get with it, okay? Well, some glad morning when this life is o'er, I my way to a home on God's celestial shore. life have grown I'll fly away oh like a bird from prison bars have flown I'll fly away Got just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away Oh, to that land where joy shall never end I'll fly away, lift it up tonight, come on I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away Well, when I die, oh hallelujah, by and by Oh, let's sing that third verse again. Well, we've got just a few more weary days, and then I'll fly away. Oh, to a land where joy shall never end. Oh, I'll fly away. holy name. Now if you're going to fly away, you got to have something inside of you to get you there. And hopefully you can look what God has done for you tonight. I know that there's probably a lot of testimonies out here tonight, but we can sum it up in this song, right? Look what the Lord has done. Well, look what the Lord has done. Oh, look what the Lord has done. Well, He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me and it was just in time And I'm gonna praise His name For each day He's just the same Come on and praise Him Look what the Lord has done Oh, come on now Look what the Lord has done Oh, just look what the Lord has done Well, He healed my body He touched my mind just in time I'm gonna praise his name Oh, each day he's just the same Come on and praise him Look what the Lord has done Oh, lift it up to him tonight I said, look what the Lord has done Oh, come on now Look what the Lord has done Well, he healed my body He touched my mind he saved me and it was just in time. I'm going to praise his name. He saved he's just the same. Come 
Come on and praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, let's go to the enemy's camp. Come on. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Oh, I took back what he stole from me. Yes, I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole. Come on now. Well, he's under my feet. 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 Satan is under. Stop it. Wayne just looked at me and told me to jump up and down. He said, Why ain't you bouncing? I seen Jim in the corner of my eye. He's a little bit bigger than I am, and he was bouncing. Come on up, Wayne. You bounce with me, and I'll bounce. If this platform can hold me. All right. Come on. Let's get into this. Will I win? he stole from me oh I took back what he stole from me yes I took back what he stole from me I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole come on now let's do it he's under my feet he's under my feet he's under my feet Come on now, well, I said I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me Oh, I took back what he stole from me Yes, I took back what he stole from me Well, I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole Come on now, he's under my feet He's under my feet He's under my feet. 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 When I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Oh, I took back what he stole from me. Yes, I took back what he stole from me. Well, I went to the enemy's camp. Took back what he stole from me. Come on. He's under my feet. 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 Satan. Oh, come on. He's under my feet. Well, he's under my feet. 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 Satan is under my feet. I can't sing and jump at the same time. Praise the Lord. Are you glad you're here tonight? Huh? Can we have fun? I mean, that's why we come to church. To enjoy the presence of the Lord. To let the joy of the Lord infill us tonight. Man, that's what it's all about. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. I probably need to slow it down. I feel Jesus. I feel Jesus. Come on. I feel Jesus in this place. Yes, my soul does. Oh, burn within me. I feel. Can you lift your hands and just worship Him tonight? He's worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Come on. And I feel Jesus. He inhabits the praise tonight. Oh, I feel Jesus. Oh, He's in this house. 
up and down these aisles tonight. Come on, let's worship him. Oh, and I feel Jesus. He's in our midst tonight. Oh, I feel whatever needs you have tonight. All you got to do is call out to him. He's here to minister tonight. I feel Jesus. of you tonight. Oh, yes. My soul does. The power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, it burns within me. I feel Jesus in this. Can we sing it just one more time tonight? God and honor him. Oh, and I feel Jesus. He's worthy tonight. I feel Jesus. Oh, bless his name. I feel Jesus. Oh, glory to God. In this place, oh, let him burn down deep inside. Yes, my soul does. Oh, it burns within me. I feel Jesus. Can we sing that last line again? Yes, my soul. Come on now. Oh, and yes, my soul does. Oh, it burns within me. I feel Jesus. You can be seated. He's going to come on up. Thank you, Wayne. We've been talking for, oh, about the last three weeks now uh, about you know, minister appreciation, and uh, actually tonight is the last in that series uh, that I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to share with you a few verses tonight in Matthew. This is in the 13th chapter. It's verses 53 through 58, and it says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom? And these mighty works. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph? And Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, you know, a lot of times when we reach the end of something, you, you think, well, that's, that's the 
finality of it, but actually, to tell you the truth, I almost kind of worked backwards on this because this was actually the first verse that I came up with when I was talking about minister appreciation. It may sound like an odd one actually to begin with, which is why it ended up being the last one. You know, the thing of it is, I know we've had a lot of fun with this, you know, with the exaggerated demonstrations that we've had, uh, you know, sometimes about the uh, pastor appreciation and so on. But I didn't appreciate that. Ah, <laughs> I knew I could find something we didn't appreciate. But, you know, the thing is, about these verses, what I think is amazing, Jesus has been elsewhere. He's been received very well with his teaching and everything. He's done really well. Now he's back home. He's in his hometown, so to speak, you know. He's at home. Now, all of a sudden, where's the appreciation? Where's anybody, you know, singing all his accolades now? It's not that what they're doing. They're just sitting there and looking at him and saying, well, you know, where'd you get all this stuff at? I mean, we know him. He's the guy that lives down the street, you know. I know him. He's Joseph's son, Mary's son. I remember when he was learning carpentry not too long back, you know. We know his brothers and sisters. We know all about him. So who is he? stand up here and tell us all this stuff, you know, like we're supposed to be listening to him. Now, it didn't lessen who he was in any way. He still was who he was. He still was the Messiah. He still was the Son of God. But there was no appreciation for it here because all they could see is what they were familiar with. See, it was their opinions. It was their perceptions. That's what kept it from actually being an appreciative situation. We're going to hear a lot more about that later, actually. But for right now... I want to leave it at that. The thing is, though, it's, a, it's an easy analogy. You stop and think about it. You compare him with someone else. Like, you could compare him with Steve, for example. Now, if somebody knew Steve when he was a little kid, that's what they would talk about now. They would say, well, oh, yeah, yeah, Steve, I know. I know Steve Farrell. I remember he got saved when he was just a little boy. I think he was like eight years old or something. He started preaching when he was, you know, just a lad practically. I know him, yeah. But the thing is, that's not who Steve Farrell is. Steve Farrell's not the 8-year-old kid that got saved or the 12-year-old that started preaching at Daddy's Church. That's not who he is. He's a grown man with a ministry of his own. He's a fine evangelist. He's a fine teacher. He's a good preacher. He's an outstanding singer. He's got all kinds of ministry things going on. But if you only remember the little boy, you limit his ministry tremendously because in your eyes, that's all he is. You don't see what is really being accomplished, and you don't see what God's accomplishing through him. You want to relegate him to what you remember. That little kid. Same thing happened to Jesus here. He, he, he was the son of God and could do anything, and yet all they could see was he was the boy down the street. No appreciation for that. Amen? Amen. It's time for us to take up our tithes and offerings. And have the ushers come forward, please. And I'm going to ask Fonda if she would pray over the offering tonight, please. Amen. The sun is shining bright. My heart is filled with gladness here above the cares of life. But I just come through the valley of trouble, fear, and pain. It was there I came to know my God enough to stand and say, Even in the valley, God is good. Even in the valley, He is faithful and true. He 
carries his children through like he said he would even in the valley God is good this road of life has led you to a valley of defeat you wonder if the father has heard your desperate plea but there's hope in this rugged place where tears of sorrow dwell can't you hear him gently whispering i am here and all is Steve was talking about y'all having to suffer with him earlier. Uh, now you'll have to suffer with me. Uh, this song actually has, um, for me, it holds um, a very important value to it. First is it's kind of a prayer in that when you first come to the knowledge of Christ and you understand that you need forgiveness, you sometimes question what it is to be forgiven. So this song kind of talks about that. And at the same time, the other meaning it has for me is it's actually the first song I ever wrote and fully completed. So some of you have heard it before. Um, for those of you that have, it's been a while. It's probably been about two years since I've sang it. So pray with me. Hope I can remember all of the words. And don't worry about my off-key voice. It's going to happen. <laughs> If I give my life to you, will everything be all right? If I give my life to you, will I make it through this night? I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I know I'll be fine. The Lord, you've always been a shine. Until the end, I can 
can't explain the way I feel, the joy that flows within. Lord, you've always been my one true friend. Jesus, Savior of my life. Jesus, come be mine tonight. Oh, Jesus, my one true So glad you forgave all my sins. And then I hear a voice that's ringing out from heaven's golden shore, saying, Come, you heavy laden, I'm what you're looking for. Oh, and even though you stumble, I won't cast you out. Your faith in me. Now take away your doubt. Jesus. Savior of my life, Jesus, come be mine tonight, oh, Jesus, my one true friend, I'm so glad you forgave all my sins. the Savior of my life, Jesus, Lord, come be mine tonight, oh, Jesus, my one true friend. Sing this next part with me. I surrender all. Special thanks to Jonathan Estep for playing the guitar for this song. Jonathan's invisible, so you can't see him tonight. I don't know if y'all noticed the banner behind us on the wall. I mentioned it on Sunday that um, we're in the next couple of services off and on. You're going to hear sermons about tearing down walls. And um, one thing I've learned in six years of pastoring and then I don't know how many other years in other ministry, that you and I have the tendency to build up a lot of walls. Amen. Somebody say amen. And these walls are not intended to be built. And in fact, these walls have the tendency to get in our way of God. Somebody say amen. amen. It prevents him from getting into our lives and blessing us the way he wants to. So if you notice up there is a scripture verse that goes along with that banner. It says Psalms 127 and 1 says it like this. Unless the Lord builds the house, 
they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Amen. So you're going to hear sermons on that in the next couple of services. So be prepared. Study up on it if you want to. Be ready for it. Amen. Children's Church, quietly walk back, please. Mama. It is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm going to do something a little different because I typically do not sing by a track. But this song, oh my, I have just been playing it over and over and over and over again. And I'm like, I have to find the track to this. And I did. And um, I'm going to try to sing it tonight. Some of you may have heard this song before called Take Me to the King. The woman who sings it can really tear it up. I'm going to Loriize it, and it's going. <laughs> it'll be it'll be me tearing it up. <laughs> um, but um, if Ben wants to go ahead and start that, take me to the king. <laughs> That's not it. Somebody lift your hand. That's not it. I'm tired Options are few I'm trying to pray But where are you? I'm all churched out Hurt and abused I can't think what's left I'm weak, no strength to fight, no tears to cry, even if I try, but still my soul refuses to die. One touch will change my life. Take me to the king, I don't have much to bring, my heart is torn in pieces, it's my offering, lay me at the throne, leave me there alone, to gaze upon you. It's time to stop playing these games. Oh, we need a word for the people's pain. So, Lord, speak right now. Let it fall like rain. We're desperate. We're chasing after you. No religion I've made my decision 
decision to run to you the healer that I need take me to the king I don't have much to bring my heart is torn Apparently, uh, from what I understand, apparently tonight is a night of suffering. Uh, we supposedly had to suffer with Steve as the song leader, and then we had to suffer through Robert doing his singing, and now you're going to have to suffer through me bringing the message. Now, I know that Wayne apparently has a lot of confidence in my ability to do that because just a minute ago he brought me over a microphone and told me that this was the microphone I should use when I went up there. It didn't seem like it had a lot of life to it. turned out there wasn't a battery in it. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't really want to hear what I got to say. <laughs> you, you can draw your own conclusions from that. Yeah. But, you know, it, you do have a tendency to wonder. Hmm. Anyway, what I want to do first, I always uh, like to open my sermons, as you probably know by now, with a little prayer that God gave me. And uh, I'd like if everyone would join me, please. Heavenly Father, fill my mind with your thoughts. Fill my heart with your love. Flood my soul with your grace. And now, if you will, fill my mouth with your words. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let me get that up just for a second here, if you don't mind. On Sunday evening, Wayne kicked off a series of sermons about the building up and the tearing down of walls. As he pointed out, we've got a poster up here about it now walls you know everybody has got walls whether we want to admit it or not we may not like to you know come out and say so but we've got walls all of us now some of them we constructed ourselves some of them were constructed by others but the thing is we probably allowed them to do it see walls are destructive they divide and separate us no question about that sometimes they separate us from each other sometimes they separate us from God there's all kinds of walls out there, and I figure in the next couple of weeks, you're probably going to hear about a lot of them. But tonight, I'm going to talk about walls that are created by opinions and perceptions. If you were listening, you already heard me refer to that when we were taking up the offering. Walls of insecurity and doubt, and some preaching walls. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, that's way, way too much to be bringing in one message, and you're right. You're thinking nobody in their right mind would attempt to do all of that. You're right again. Nobody in their right mind would. That's why I'm going to do it. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you all believe that it's possible for people's opinions and perspectives to alter the intentions of God? 
Just think about it just for a second. I don't, I don't want you to give me any answers right now. Just think for a second about that. Do you think it's possible for people's perceptions and opinions to alter God's direction, his intent? Well, I do, and I'm going to tell you why. Let's look back at the scripture that I used during the offering tonight. Now, Matthew, that was in 13, 53 through 58. It says in verse 58, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, do you think that that was his intent? Do you think that he intended not to do a lot of work in his own hometown, so to speak? Do you think that was his desire to not do a whole lot in his own hometown? Yeah. See, I don't think it was. It, when, you, when you're in your own hometown, if you will, you're not, you're not looking to do less for the people that you grew up around, less for the people that you knew. I'm sure that he intended to do plenty, but there was a problem. Their unbelief didn't allow it to happen. Now, he was no less the son of God when he was in his hometown, and he was no less the Messiah when he was in his hometown. But their opinions and perceptions, they were described here as unbelief. That's the word that's used. But that's what short-circuited his loving intentions for the people in his own home area. You want another example? Well, this is probably even a better one. You should be familiar with it. Matthew 23, 37 through 39 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent to thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gather her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's a pretty, if you, if you think about it, that, that's a really a picture of sorrow if you stop and think about it. That's a wall, a wall that they built between God and themselves, his chosen people, a wall between them. But do you see any place in there where it says that he didn't want to do any more than that? In fact, it says very plainly, I would have done this. I would have, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't. I would, but you wouldn't. That was his intent. That was his desire, Norman. He intended to do it, but you see, walls can and do change the very intent of God. You know, everybody's got opinions. Just about, really, on everything that you can come up with, everybody's got an opinion. They're entitled to them. Nothing wrong with having an opinion. Nothing wrong with expressing them in the right situation, the right time, right setting. One opinion, if you think about it, probably is just as important as any other. But you can't allow the opinions of other people to define who you are. Amen. You cannot do that. See, if you allow the opinions of others to dictate your behavior, you're never going to rise above the limits that they set for you, and you're destined to sink to the depths that they've consigned you to. Opinions end up being traps a lot of times if we let them be. Now, as some of you know, I, I know Donna, for example, there. I know I've talked to her about this and Norman. Some of you know I get pretty nervous when I preach. Don't really uh, enjoy the spotlight up here, so to speak. Um, and I've talked about it with some of you, but I'm going to tell you something tonight that you probably don't know. I've got a really good reason for being nervous about coming up here to preach. You see, and I'm going to make a confession to you here. The reason I'm nervous about preaching is I don't know how to preach. Now, it's true. I don't really know anything about preaching, and I'm going to prove it to you. A couple years ago, when I first started preaching, I'd only preached a couple of times, as a matter of fact. We had a preaching seminar out here at church. I know a lot of you probably remember that. We were instructed in the basics of effective preaching. Our instructor at the time was someone who was on the pastoral staff here at the church. He gave us the... I guess you'd call it the do's and the don'ts of preaching, preaching 101, so to speak. That night I found out a lot of things, Norman. I don't know if you remember, but I found out a whole bunch of stuff. I found out, for example, that we're supposed to stay in a six-foot box when we preach. And the epicenter of that box is the center of this pulpit. So that means I can go this way one step, and I can go this way one step. If I go any further than that, I've broken the preaching rules. So much for that. Get that out of the way right off the bat. Uh, so you think about it, wandering outside the box there, what, what is the big deal about that? Well, according to what I was told, you all can't follow me if I do that. It distracts you all. So 
when somebody like Wayne or Steve or anybody's out there in the audience or going up and down the aisles or anything like that, apparently you guys are getting nothing out of that because you're too distracted. <laughs> That's what we were taught, you know, so I'm sure it must be true. Now, I'm going to try my best to stay inside that box tonight because, frankly, I haven't preached in quite a while and I want to make sure I stick with the notes pretty closely that he gave me. But I also found out something else that we can do. Norm, mustn't point. No, you, you don't point, folks, because the reason you don't point is because somebody in the crowd assumes that you're pointing at them, and therefore the preaching is directly at them, and they're offended. Just mustn't point. Can't do that. Now, you also can't pound on the pulpit to make an emphasis for point, and I do that, but, you know, out here I've quit doing it because I'm afraid with the one we've got, I'm afraid I'll break it. Now, when I had the big one that Norman made, I used to be able to pound on that, and that was pretty good, but I've, I've, you know, I'm following the rules now, so I'm, I'm not going to do it. No making, no points. Okay. I can't take my glasses off and on, even though I have problems sometimes seeing. I can't do that because, again, see, if I do that when I'm preaching, that'll distract you all, and you won't be able to follow the message. And, well, we don't want that to happen. And I can't address the congregation as you. Can't do that. Because, again, if I address it as you see, then you're going to take it to mean you. Personally, you're going to internalize everything I say and say that I said it all about you. Therefore, I can't do that either. Man, a lot of things I can't do. And you know the funny thing is I've been known to violate every single one of those rules. And I guess that means, as I said before, I really don't know much about preaching. Sorry. Now, I also learned, and this is really, really important in that same seminar, Norman. This is the big, big key thing. Those were important. Don't get me wrong. But I also found out that there are three types of sermons, three different types of sermons. Now, later I read a book that said there was actually four. But anyway, and I've got to be very, very careful with these three or four types of sermons because I have to alternate them on a rotational basis. You know, so like you guys never hear the same type of sermon two times in a row. So that, that's what I have to do to be effective. I have to make sure that I do that. I mean, you know, wow, three types, four types, whatever. However many types of sermons. I mean, who knew? Yeah, I didn't know. I thought there was only one kind of sermon. I thought that was the kind God gave me. <laughs> you know, that's the only one I know anything about. Now, frankly, it's the only one I care to know anything about. Amen. Now, when I found out about all these different types of sermons, and I found out that I had to rotate them to be a decent preacher. I don't know if I did right or not, but I didn't say anything to God about it. Because, see, I, I wasn't sure that he knew that he had to rotate. And, and I was afraid if he didn't, I didn't want to embarrass him. So I just left it out. But that's just something else that I don't know about preaching, probably. Funny thing about that seminar, you know, when God called me to preach... One of the things that he did, it was sort of like it was like a big coloring book. And I mean a really enormous coloring book. And he gave me this book, huge book, and he told me, he says, color. That's all he said. He just said color. He says, I'll inspire you. I'll give you everything you need. Color. Oh, I'm out of the box. Um, so I thought that's what I was supposed to do until I went to the seminar and found out that I was wrong on that. See, the seminar taught me, Norman, with all these things, they taught me that you can color, but the book's really very, very small. It's nowhere near like the book that God gave me that was so large to do so much in. It's a real small book, and you cannot color outside the lines. And those lines, we've just defined pretty much what they were. You just can't do that. You've got to stay with inside those lines. They, they took God... I hope I don't break no rules here. They, they took God, and they, and they tied him up, and they stuffed him in a box, and they put a nice fancy ribbon and bow on the outside of it, and they said, there you are, God. Go sit in the corner. We're going to have church now, and we don't really expect you to be part of it. That's some of the stuff I learned in the seminar. You know, think about that. This is just me again now. This is my opinion. Don't look for this in the Bible. But I figure the way that I was taught to preach it, God and the Holy Ghost put together couldn't have wedged their way into that service with a crowbar. But that was the kind of preaching I was supposed to emulate. 
See, I don't think so. But then what do I know? I don't know how to preach. Last year, Pastor Wayne preached a message where he talked about Pentecostal ministers and said that they all know certain buzzwords, certain phrases. You might remember that, Norman. They're uh, phrases that you can use at an opportune time, I guess, during a service to elicit a certain response from the congregation. Now, you know, if you were to do something like that, if those kind of practices, they could be used to kind of artificially stoke the fire in a service, I suppose. Not that Wayne suggested that, and he wouldn't. I, that's not what I'm saying at all. Don't misunderstand me. That he, he didn't say that. But I remember when he said that, the comment got a lot of amens from a lot of the ministers. And I'm going to have to admit to you, I didn't have the slightest idea about what any of the words or the phrases was, and I still don't. And I wouldn't use them if I knew. <laughs> So I don't really much care. Sorry. But I guess that means that all of us Pentecostal ministers don't know those things. Because I didn't know it. But then again, I don't know how to preach. Now, there was a lull in my ministry for, I guess it was about two years. In, in about two years' time, I never, I never preached one single full-length sermon in this church. And only preached a couple of times anywhere. I kind of figured at that point that maybe God just wasn't going to use me that way anymore. You know, I mean, you know, it kind of spoke for itself. I wasn't a kid to start with, and I wasn't getting any younger. It doesn't work like that. So I'm thinking, that, you know, no opportunities are showing up. I'm not going to preach anymore, maybe. But then something weird happened, Norman. You were, you were there, so you might remember. Opportunity came when there was a chance, a need, so to speak, to preach a sermon about tithing. So I volunteered to preach the sermon about tithing. Now, you know, the thing about, if you know anything about tithing, you don't have a whole lot of other folks that's volunteering for that sermon anyway. So it's not like you have to sit there and knock them out of the way and say, come on, please t take me, you know. It's not like that. There was actually one volunteer, and it was me. Therefore, I qualified, and I was picked to do that. So since I got the opportunity to do it, I sought God for a message the same way I always do. I asked him, please, you know, give me a message that would be effective on a subject like that. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I came to church that night. Norman, I thought I was all ready to go. I really did. I mean, I was scared to death because I hadn't preached in so long. But I was, I was fired up. I was ready. I had studied. I was ready to go. And the pastor came over to me and said, can I read your notes before you go up? There ain't nothing good follows that. <laughs> but I said, sure. Uh -huh. You know, go ahead. So he took them and he read them. He brought them back over to me a little bit later and he says, you know, I think you need to change this part. And uh, you can't say that. And, well, I think I'd leave this part here out. And, th and this over here, I, I think I'd just change it all around. So there I was, minutes from the pulpit. And if I made all the alterations that I was just told to make, again, I don't know much about preaching, but I was smart enough to realize that there was no sermon left. <laughs> and that kind of worried me a little, because I kind of figured standing in front of the crowd ain't what I do best anyway. And standing up there without a sermon, that really wasn't going to be good. So I thought, well, the sermon that's left, um, there's no meat left in it whatsoever. I've got no sermon left. So I looked at him, and I guess the way I looked at him, it must have kind of said that. It must have said, dude, I have no sermon left. So he said, well, you know, just, just do whatever you think's right. <laughs> that, that took a load off. So I went up on the stage, and I was determined to give you exactly what God gave me. I opened that sermon. Anybody that was here remembers it because I opened it with a disclaimer, which, again, you're just not supposed to do. But, but, but I don't know how to preach, so it doesn't matter. Did it anyway. You know, and I preached it just exactly like I had it planned. Now, when the message was actually pretty well received, it, as well as a tithing message is going to be received anyway, you know, uh, the pastor came over after the service, and he congratulated me. You know, he says, it was good. He said, and he said that he hadn't believed that it would be because he just didn't, he just didn't think when he read it that it was going to work. 
And he told me that it worked because of my presentation. That's what he told me. You know, I have to be honest with you. I know that this is just something else I don't know about preaching, and I certainly don't mean to be disrespectful in any way, but it wasn't my presentation that made it any good. It wasn't my anything that made it good. It didn't have anything to do with me. It was the message, not the messenger. You see, if you doubt my message, you doubt the person that gave it to me. I only give such as I receive. One other example I just want to offer of how little I know about preaching. One of our former members, he was on the staff out here when he was here, actually, during his time here. And after he left, I want you to understand, these are his words, not mine. After he left, he told me one of the problems with mission was very clearly the preaching. Uh, he didn't really say that the preaching was bad, so to speak. What he said was it was the content of our preaching. That was what was wrong with it. See, there was simply too much preaching going on out here that was judgmental. Too much focusing on sin and the consequences thereof. Uh, people don't want to hear about negative things. We're supposed to preach uplifting sermons about God's love all the time. Now, we need to make sure that everybody leaves feeling good rather than hearing about hell or sin and maybe feeling down. We've got to choose our sermon topics better and more judiciously. That's what I was told. Now again, I, I know this is just more evidence of the fact that I don't know anything about preaching, but see, I don't get that. I don't get that at all, because the thing is, I'm going to repeat it. There's only one type of sermon out there, and it's the kind that God gives you. God provides the message. It's not the preacher that provides the message. We're not the one that chooses what we preach about. Or we certainly shouldn't be. Any minister that's going to bring a message up here that's of his own choosing, this is just me again, that's a minister that I think ought to go sit on the pew instead of standing in front of the pews preaching. If you're not pleased with the content of the message that you're hearing, your complaint's with God, not with the preacher. Now, I know in today's everything goes and it's not my fault society. I know you don't want to hear about that. Nobody ever wants to hear about that. We don't want to hear about our own accountability for anything. We don't want to think about the consequences of sin, Norman. That's, that's not uplifting. That's ugly. It's not pleasant. They ain't going there. You know, they just don't want to go there. But the thing is, that doesn't change anything. It doesn't make any difference whether you want to go there or not because it doesn't change things like Romans 14 and 8, which says, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. It doesn't change Romans 6 and 23, which says, for the wages of sin is death. It doesn't, say, it doesn't change that a bit. You can like it or not. It doesn't change it. That's how it is. That's what it's in there for. Now, that kind of preaching might not appeal to the masses, but you know something? Preaching messages that's pleasing, that's not what we're called to do. I, know, I don't know anything about anybody ever being called to preach just pretty messages. You know, I've never heard of it. We're called to do just exactly what we're instructed to do in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. It says, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And it's here right now, by the way. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they'll be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So what's that mean, Norm? I mean, the way I get it, it says, preach the word, preach sound doctrine, even if the people don't want to hear it. It doesn't make any difference. Preach it anyway. When they walk out on you and go to the people that they uh, get the pleasant message that they want to hear from, then just preach it harder. Because it doesn't change because they rejected it. Evangelize the world with the truth of the gospel. And that's all of the truth of the gospel. And that's just my opinion. What do I know? But after all, we've pretty much established I may not know much about preaching. Okay, I'll give you that. But maybe... As everybody kept telling me, maybe I don't know how to preach, but I do know somebody who does. Yeah, and I do know somebody that does, and I know enough to get out of his way and let him do what he wants to do. Now, that might be all, frankly, that I really do know about preaching. But maybe, just maybe, that's all I need to know. 
Now, you probably think, man, he's nuts. First off, he can't preach anyway. I don't know what he's doing. But you might think, well, where's he heading with this? Because it sure doesn't seem to be going anywhere that I understand. I'll tell you something. Whether or not you agree with anything I've said so far, you might be asking yourself, what's this all got to do with your Christian walk? I'm going to tell you. It's a question of tearing down the walls of doubt. It's a question of worthless or worthy. That's the title of tonight's sermon, by the way. I finally got to that. <laughs> tearing down the walls of doubt, worthy or worthless, which way do you see yourself? Now, I'm sure that you've noticed that up to this point, I've been presenting a lot of evidence to prove to you that I can't not preach. I don't know nothing about preaching. But what you might not have noticed is that all the points I've listed were all somebody else's words, not mine. Remember the warning I gave you earlier about the opinions of others? How many of you have been exposed to less than flattering opinions of other people regarding your self-worth? Come on, give me a show of hands at least. You, nobody has ever put you down, made you feel like you're inferior, made you feel like you don't measure up. Come on. Darn near every hand in here. And the rest of you is just lying. <laughs> now, it's pretty common, actually, that that would happen to you. In fact, it's too common. You know that most of us have got walls that separate us from God or at least separate us from the fullness of God, one of the two. But the really sad thing is that many times we're the one that constructed the wall. And sometimes an even sadder aspect of the story is that we do so mostly because we can't deal with the man of what we see in the mirror every day. And that's the truth. I mean, we, re we really have self-image problems. Most all of us do. It's a fact. We don't want to talk about it, and nobody here is going to admit to it. Trust me. I know. <laughs> we do. We don't like the reflection we see of ourselves in the mirror. We don't like to see the reflection of all those shortcomings. Unfortunately, the thing of it is, it's just like an anorexic or bulimic teenager we're overreacting to a false image. Now, where did that image come from? Where, you know, it didn't just pop up there. I mean, where did we get these negative images that we've got? Well, for those of you that grew up in a loving, caring, nurturing environment where your every accomplishment got praise and your every idea was indulged, you probably aren't going to relate to too much of this. But I invite you to come along with me on this ride anyhow. For those of you that were raised in what we now call the accepted norm, in other words, a dysfunctional family, this might seem a little bit more familiar to you. As a lot of you have no doubt noticed by this time, everybody in the world is not out to help you have a good self-image. Had you ever noticed that? I mean, if you're really looking at all, you've seen that by now? I can tell you something. I spent the majority of my life hearing how I wasn't something enough, whatever. You fill in the blank. I mean, I wasn't big enough, strong enough, tall enough, smart enough, cute enough, talented enough, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on for hours. Whatever it was, I wasn't. There wasn't really any hope for me, actually. You know, I mean, I wasn't going to measure up. No way, never. Never going to succeed. Never going to amount to anything. And you know what? You know how I knew that? I knew that because it was the collective opinion of such an illustrious panel of experts consisting of my so-called friends, my teachers, my bosses, even my own family. <laughs> See, Satan will use anybody and everybody that he can against you to make you feel bad about yourself. That's his job, and he's good at it. But God loves you. He doesn't want you to feel bad about yourself. He wants you to feel good about yourself. Now, how could such a varied group possibly be wrong? Well, it's pretty simple if you really get right down to it. You know, people don't think about this very much, but most people try to keep you down because they believe it somehow elevates them. Amen. And it doesn't, by the way. Others don't want your talents to be noticed in the first place because they fear that you're actually more talented than they are. It's true. They maintain their position by keeping you buried. A lot of managers on jobs do that. Results from their insecurity. If you hear anything often enough, no matter how erroneous it might be, you're going to start to believe it must be true. Everybody says it. Come on, it's got to be true. Why does everybody say it? You must really be that person, right? Everyone wouldn't keep saying it otherwise. 
It carries over into your relationship with Jesus, though. That's the problem. That's when it really gets to be a problem. It's bad enough that what you do to yourself and how you torture yourself and have to live with that. But when it gets into your relationship with God, that's sad. You know, you know people be like, I, I can't do. I can't do what God wants me to do. Well, I could never minister, teach, preach, evangelize, be a missionary. Why? Well, I could never even lead anybody to God. I couldn't do any of that. Well, I'm not smart enough. I'm not experienced enough. Donna, I'm not spiritual enough. I couldn't do it. I'm not whatever enough. Does that sound familiar? Well, it ought to, because all it is is you parroting back to God the garbage that people's been dumping on you all of your life, and you're expecting him to accept it just because you did. <laughs> God, I must really be that person because everyone keeps saying it, right? No, it's not right. Do me a favor. Just make sure that everybody's still awake. Repeat after me. No, no. it's not right. It's not right. I, am not I am not that person. Hey, most of you are awake. That's cool. Now, for every one of you that's ever been made to feel worthless by other people, I want to offer you a poem. Just measuring up. I didn't cause too much trouble. My grades, they were okay. I did all of my chores at home and went to school every day. Teachers said I'd never measure up. My parents thought so too. I wish I didn't know that because there were things I hoped to do. See, I wanted to be a writer. And I was trying to learn how. Or maybe play guitar. But, yeah, there's no use trying now. They say I'm not a thinker. Yet I'm often deep in thought. I don't think about the things I am. I reflect on all the things I'm not. Since I know I'll never measure up, I'm just smart enough, you see, to know that there's nothing special that'll ever come from me. See, I wish I wasn't such a disappointment. Gee, that would be swell. But I know that's all I'll ever be because you taught me so very well. Matthew 27 and 51 says the veil was torn down and the wall between God and man was torn down with it. Amen. Amen. So why do we allow opinions and perceptions that are birthed by Satan and expressed by others to rebuild them? Now think about that for a minute. We say we're saved. We say we're born again. We're a new creation in Christ, but we have all the old thoughts, the old insecurities, and the old doubts and worthlessness that we carry around with us. Just as Jesus couldn't do any mighty works in his own hometown, God can't do the mighty works he wants to do in us. We beat ourselves up and we hold ourselves back from being all that we can be, and more importantly, all we can be in God. We let that poor self-image rule in our life just like Satan wants us to. That's where it originates from. He's got a pretty elaborate way of getting it done, and we fall into the trap every time. He does all he can to feed your insecurity and your supposed inferiorities. See, that way you can be of little real use to God. If he can't keep you lost, Norman, the next best thing for him to do is keep you ineffective. Amen? See, if you think very little of yourself, you'll do very little for God. It's just that simple. If he can control you this way, you're going to remain pretty much a defeated Christian. Right where he wants you. If you're a Christian at all, defeated Christian's the next best thing as far as he's concerned. You remain buried in your addictions, your depressions, and your perceived unworthiness, just like he wants you to. It's high time that we as Christians, though, as blood-bought, born-again children of God, if we start realizing who we are, I ain't, I ain't hitting it hard, I promise. Not of ourselves, because we are who we are because he is who he is. Amen. Amen? Stand up and lay claim to who you are in Jesus. You know, we don't have to keep saying these kinds of things. Here, we'll get some responses going here. I can't do whatever God asks. Well, Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not important enough. 1 Corinthians 2, 27 and 8 says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base, insignificant things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Well, but I've been rejected. Matthew 21 and 42, Jesus says unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So you've been rejected. The Son of God was rejected. Get over it. Come on. You got to get beyond the wall of doubt that you've built up or you've allowed to be built up. You got to overcome our perceived unworthiness that we have. We got to quit hiding behind all of our addictions, our depressions, and our insecurities and follow what 1 Corinthians 16 and 13 told us. It says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you. That means be brave, like men, be strong. Amen. Well, you just don't understand, man. You, you, you don't know my situation. No, you don't know my God. <laughs> But you don't get it. I'm not worthy. You, you don't know who I am. You, you, you don't know what I've done. Well, my God knows who you are, and he don't care what you've done. <laughs> you want any proof? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave his only. He gave his best. And he gave it for whosoever. Whosoever, in case you don't know that big long word, is you. Romans 5 and 8, but God commendeth, that means demonstrated, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He felt you were worth it to the extent that he took the punishment for your sin. 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any, any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. His will is that all be saved. Unworthy? All, folks. All means all. Luke 15, 3 through 7. The parable of the lost sheep concludes by saying, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Still feel unworthy? Well, apparently the God of all glory finds you worthy, not worthless. What do you got to say about that? The 12 apostles that Jesus chose, they weren't not the cream of Jewish society, folks. They were fishermen, tax collectors, you know. They, they were the dregs of society, not the pinnacle. But he chose them anyway. They didn't measure up. They've been told, I guarantee all their life that they were nothing. Never would be. Never would amount to anything. That sounds familiar. Somebody said that a few minutes ago. But he chose them anyway. The rich man lived a life of luxury. While Lazarus was a beggar. But the rich man awoke in torment and got to view Lazarus content in Abraham's bosom. A thief with a very short time to live said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He'd lived a sin-filled life. He didn't have any reason whatsoever to believe that he'd be heard other than maybe faith. He was in paradise that same day. I know that because the Bible says so. See, these examples, they didn't have any reason to dare to hope. None whatsoever. And I'm sure that they'd been told somewhere along the line that they weren't any good and that they didn't measure up and all that. But remember something. When it seems that you don't have any hope, my God is your hope. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Does not matter who you were. Your past is history. Your future is a mystery. Become who you can be in Jesus. Amen. Just wanted to step out of the box again. I'm sorry. Right. Something wrong with me. <laughs> Ignore those that want to remind you of your past failings or to try to be a wet blanket on all your dreams. I know that's not always easy, because you know sometimes who those wet blankets are? 
Wow, they can be your boss. Sometimes they're your friend. <laughs> a lot of times it's your family. A lot of times. And sometimes it's even your spouse. But you can't allow that to make any difference. It doesn't matter who it is. You can't let them destroy your relationship with God. They, they can make it more difficult, sure, but just pray for them and keep on going. Tear the wall down. I'm going to go back to the opening for a minute. Let me ask you something. Think about this for a second while I break the rule once more. How do you think I felt when I was first called to preach? I was nearly 55 years old, no background in public speaking whatsoever. In fact, I don't even like to speak in public right now. So I haven't much changed on that. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not confident at it. And then you can throw in on top of that all the things I was told about, well, you don't know what you're doing, and all the advice and help that I got there. It was pretty obvious, really, if you stop and think about it, that most folks didn't have much confidence in my ability. So you know what I did? I gave up, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm way out of the box. I'm sorry. The box is going to have to come over here. Yeah. I, I gave up. What I did, I, I threw a great big pity party, I invited Norman and some of my friends, and I sat around and whined and cried about how <sighs> nothing seems to be going right, Norman. Nobody, you know, nobody really wants me to do this anymore. Preaching ain't going so good, you know. Nobody's getting saved, you know, when I did preach. I mean, there's just no point, right? I'm just, I'm just going to quit. Well, let me tell you something. That's not what I did. The answer to that question is a very large no. Because God provided two people that did believe in me. First off, he gave me a wife that stands up for me and my efforts. Thank you. And he sent me another woman who saw promise in me when no one else did. And she provided me an opportunity to minister when no one else did. And I'd like to thank Sister Jewel Rogers, even though she's not here. I wish she was. So long story short, I do still minister when the opportunity arises. I do still, still can't talk. I do still speak the words that he gives me, regardless of whether it makes everybody happy or not. You know, I could have listened to all that negative rhetoric. I could have listened to Satan when he told me to quit. <clears throat> and heaven knows he said it enough. <laughs> I had plenty of chances. I could have stayed hidden behind that wall. It doesn't seem like that's what you're supposed to do. Looks to me like you're supposed to get through that. You're supposed to tear that down. See, I couldn't stay behind that wall because that wouldn't have been obedient. Satan might use every tool and manipulation that there is out there to convince me that I am not worthy, that I'm worthless. But my God tells me otherwise. Amen. He tells me that I can preach, Norman, and I do. He tells me what to say, and I say it. He tells me that I'm worthy, not worthless, and I believe him. You know why? Because my God doesn't lie. <laughs> and he says the same things about you, every one of you. Let me ask you, which way do you see yourself? If you see yourself as worthless and not worthy, then you've got work to do. Yeah, I know that's blunt. We're not supposed to be blunt either. I know that wasn't in the seminar, but I'm sure I've heard that somewhere. But I didn't listen too good to that either. I'm serious. If you see yourself as worthless and not worthy, you've got work to do. Let God do the work that he wants to do in you. Satan has, he's got a scheme that works really well in this world. Like I said, you know, when I'm talking about all these things that people say, you know, no, it's not Satan himself, obviously, that communicates these things to you. But he's got plenty of people that will. And it's not always even, to be honest with you, this might step on somebody's religion a little bit, but it's not always Satan's followers that are doing this to you. Your Christian brothers and sisters will do it to you too. Not because that they're trying necessarily to be mean to you. I don't mean that. But the thing of it is, it's so ingrained in us that we can't. It's so ingrained in us that we're a failure and everything that we try, we're going to fall flat on our face. 
It's so ingrained in us to do that that when somebody else comes up to you, it's very rare that you give them a hand up and say, you can do it, brother. Normally what you do is, okay, ooh, Norman, I don't know, man. I don't know if y'all try that or not. Big step. You know, I mean, I'm your friend. I like you. You know that. We've been friends for years. But I'm worried about you if you try that. See, I don't know, man. I don't know. That's not telling you that you can't, but it sure ain't telling you that you can. And that's your sisters and brothers. Again, don't take me wrong. I, I'm not criticizing Christians. I'm not, I'm really not. I'm just trying to be honest with you. That's what people do. Sometimes well-meaning. Most times not. But sometimes, you know, if it's your Christian brothers and sisters, they probably meant well by what they said. But the thing is, it still feeds into the fact that you don't have the confidence to stand up and do what you're supposed to do. You're looking somewhere for the strength that you don't have. And the problem is you don't look for it where it is coming from. You don't look for it from him. You're trying to find it. It's, it's like me. If I don't have enough confidence to think I can do something, Mike, I want you to give me the confidence. Help me out. Come on. Tell me something good about myself. You know, tell me, build me up somehow so I'll think that I'm something special. Because I don't have enough confidence. Everybody else has told me for years that I'm nothing. I need you to help me. No offense, Mike. You're my friend too, but... I don't need you to help me. I need him to help me. And if I'd go to him in the first place, I wouldn't have to rely so much on other people and worry about what they're going to think or say about me because that's not the source of my power in the first place. You guys are my friends. You know that. That's, I'm not saying anything bad about either one of you. You know that. But you're not the source of my strength. And if you are the source of my strength, that's why I'm weak. No offense. It's, it's a fact. The strength comes from up here. It doesn't come from you all. And if I think it does, I'm going to end up falling flat on my face. I don't really, you see, I, I'm not smart enough about preaching. I, I really don't have an ending. You know, if I was a good preacher and knew what I was doing, I would have had one. But, but I'm not, so I don't. All I'm going to do is just try to tell you, like I said, that these things are preventing you. They're preventing me too. They're preventing all of us from getting where we need to be in God. We need to do exactly what you see up there on that poster. It looks to me like that, that was a pretty solid, from what I can see, interlocked brick wall, right, Norman? Probably pretty solid. I'm not going to say that that was probably easy to knock down. It probably was, and it was probably pretty sturdy. But it needed to come down. And it looks to me like somebody got the message. Somebody got the message enough that they've created a hmm, pretty big hole there. You could probably drive a truck through that one. That's what you need to do in your life. That's what I need to do in my life. That's what we all need to do in our lives. Amen. And since I don't know how to end this, and I didn't have an ending, I'm just going to ask you if you would stand with me. One thing that I do, and I, I, I actually learned this from Wayne. You can learn some things from Wayne, by the way. Oh, I didn't know he was in here. I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't want you to know that. Um, I, I totally agree you never end a service without asking if there's someone lost in the crowd because, you know, you don't make assumptions as to who and what everybody's state is. I'd ask you now, if you would, every eye closed, every head bowed, please, for just a moment. Could I ask you, is there anybody in the sound of my voice that would say that, you know, I like the, the God that you were talking about tonight. I like the Jesus that I heard about tonight, but I don't know him. And I sure would like to know him. Is there anybody in here that doesn't know God as your Savior? Doesn't know Jesus, rather, as your Savior here tonight? If so, would you please just signify that by raising your hand? I'm not asking you to come up or anything right now. I'm just asking you if you would admit to that. Raise your hand, please. Okay, I don't see any hands on that. Let me ask you one further question. Did any of the stuff I said tonight hit home with anybody? Did anybody in here feel that, you know, wow, even though he didn't say me, he didn't point at me or anything and break the rules, yet I recognized myself in that. I, I, I am the kind of person that's always kept myself down because of all the things that's been said about me, the things that I've come to believe about me. I'm not accomplishing what I could for God or for myself because of what I believe about myself, what I've allowed myself to believe about myself. 
If anybody feels that way, I would urge you to come forward for prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm going to ask you right now, if you would, if there's anybody in the sound of my voice that's in need of this type of situation being healed in their life, Heavenly Father, I would pray that you would bring them forward at this point, that we could minister with them, we could pray with them about it. And, and also, let me add that if anybody wants to, just come forward for prayer. I'm, I'm not saying we're going to single you out. We're not going to talk about your situation. That's not what it's about. We just want you to have an opportunity to break through, break down the walls that are holding you back. We just want to give you that opportunity to do that. Heavenly Father, I do pray that if there's anybody in this situation that they would come forward. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'm going to open the altars now for anybody that would like to come up and pray about that matter or any other type of situation that they may have in their life. we got people up here to pray with you. Just come forward and pray if you would. Amen. Those of you that are still in your seat, what he preached tonight is true. The enemy does use our own doubts and our own fears and the opinions of others to keep us stationary, to prevent us from moving forward. If you feel that you have a call on your life and your thoughts and your fears are hindering you from answering that call, I'm going to ask you to come forward. Stand right up here if you're one of those people. Come on. Good. If you have a call on your life and your doubts and fears are hindering you from answering that call, I want you to come forward. tell you something as your pastor that's a trick of the enemy and as long as you listen to those doubts and fears you will never do anything you will be doomed to fight the same battles over and over and over and over and over again and you'll be fighting the same battles for years and years and years and years. And I think I mentioned it the other day. There will be a level of frustration come upon you. And that frustration will consume you. Because you're never moving forward. So you're dealing with doubts and fears. And you're frustrated with your walk with God. And if you don't ever overcome that, you will eventually die spiritually. You will be trapped behind a wall, and you won't have any tools to bust the wall down. Now, here's the sad thing. I have ministered to many a people who can never get past the wall. I have ministered to many a people who can never get past their own thoughts. And because of that, and it's sad, it is so sad, because Keith pointed out we do serve a God that says you're worth something, you're more than worth something, you're able you're capable, he's given you the abilities, he's given you the skills, and yet you sit there and do nothing. I'm going to tell you something. What you're doing is contrary to the Word of God, and what you're doing, you're doing to yourself. Pastor, that's me. That's not, that's not me trying to be me. That's you doing it to yourself. It's not God. You can blame Satan all you want to, but it's you. At some point in your walk with God, you've got to say, God, you're bigger than all things. God, I can count on you for everything. God, I can do all things through your son, Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. I can. Now, let me tell you something. The Lord called me into the ministry, and I didn't realize what he was doing at the age of 17. Now, I was a scrawny, pimply-faced kid who had the self-esteem, I don't know, I don't even know if I had any self-esteem at all. Thought I was dumb. Thought every word that came out of my mouth was stupid. And 
yet God still picked me up off of a Sunday school seat and put me in a junior boys class at the age of 17. You know what's cool? I didn't know what he was doing. And when I was in that situation doing what he called me to do, all my doubts and fears went away. Keith, I've gotten to preach messages for revivals before and be so nervous that my mouth would break out with blisters because I thought that I was unworthy or did not have the ability or the capability to do what God had called me to do. Here I am 20 plus years later and I'm pastoring a church. Here I am 20 plus years later and I'm still standing up, still proclaiming the love of Jesus and I can do it to junior age boys, teenage boys or girls, young adults, seniors, you name it, I'll stand up and preach the gospel to Satan himself. It doesn't bother me at all. Why? Because God proved to me that my skills are not in me. My abilities are not in me. My faith is not in me. My faith is not in you. I don't even care what you say about me now, to be quite honest with you. Some people might say, Pastor, that's being flipped. I'm not trying to be flipped. I'm serious. I don't take it from you. I don't hear it from you. I listen to what he says. I do what he says. I do when he says to do it. I don't sit back. I don't wait. I don't hesitate. If God says, get up off the couch and go walk a trail and pray to me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get up off the couch and go get in the trail and start praying to God. Somebody say amen. And if God says to me, Wayne, I want you to go preach to Dave Turner in his living room, then I'm going to go preach to Dave Turner in his living room. Why? Because it's all about God and it has zero to do with me. I'm excited by what he preached. He got called to preach five years ago. Were you going to the mission? Right after he came out here. You know what that says? I'm good. Pastor, you're being cocky. See, I went from having no self-esteem to thinking highly of myself. No, but here's what I remember. I've known Keith for a long time, and I've never seen Keith do what he's done in the last five years. Why is that? Because God called him. God prepared him. God put the words in his mouth. And when God wants him to be used, God will use him. And for those of you standing right here, the same thing applies. And for those of you that didn't get up out of your seat and come up here, the same thing applies. But pastor, you don't give me enough time to preach. Let me say this. God didn't call you to my ministry. Can I repeat that? He didn't call you to my ministry. The Mission Church of God is my ministry. He called you to preach. He didn't say who to preach to. And the last time I checked... There are millions and millions and millions of people outside these four walls that still need to hear the message of the gospel. Somebody say amen, like it or not. So those of you standing here, Keith is going to anoint you. Norman's right there with him. And here's all I can say to you. You can sit there and cry and whine again. That you can't get beyond yourself and beyond your doubts and beyond your fears. Or when they lay hands on you to anoint you, you can throw up your hands and say, God, I accept the call. God, I'm not going to whine about it. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to worry about it. God, I accept the call. And I'm going to do what you want me to do, when you want me to do it, and how you want me to do it. Somebody say amen. Because when I do those things, God, I know that you're going to be with me. You're going to speak through me, and the people that need to be reached will be reached because you did all the work. Here's your chance. Keith, anoint whoever you want to first. Norman, help him. And like I said, you can either sit there and whine and moan and groan, or you're going to throw your hands up and say, God, I accept the call.
praise you with all that I've gone through. The question just amazes me. The circumstances possibly change who I forever am in you. Since my life has changed long before these rainy days, it's never really ever crossed my mind to turn my back on you, oh Lord, my only shelter from the storm. But instead, I draw closer through these times. So I Of the clouds that may loom above, because you are much greater than my pain. You who made a way for me by suffering your destiny, so tell me what's a little rain. So I
something she wants to do, but the enemy's using something to prevent her from doing it. And all of you moms have had it before. It's called a mother's fear about something. You ever had a fear over your children before? Then you know that. Let's pray for her and ask for God to remove this fear. Just lift your 
tonight there's freedom. Oh, if you're tired and thirsty, there is freedom. Just give those walls to Jesus. Give those walls to Jesus. There is freedom. Oh, just give your walls to Jesus. There is freedom. Freedom. Freedom reigns in this place. Awesome job. He did. One thing he forgot to tell you about that class is you're not supposed to do this either. And he did that three times. He did do it. He did it three times. So he broke every rule in the book. See, he forgot one, still did it anyway. That's what I like. Amen. That's why he's my friend. That's why he's my friend. Please remember that they're selling hamburgers and stuff out there for the building fund. Let me have everyone stand. Please, please, please be in prayer for the next few services about these walls because I know that each and every minister that's uh, preaching about this is in prayer about it, and fasting about it. And I hope my prayer is is that one of us will say something to illuminate your wall. Because so many times the problem with it is is we build these prisons for ourselves and after a period of time we don't even realize that we're imprisoned. So I hope and pray my prayer is is that through this series that one of us will say something to illuminate the wall that's standing in front of you that you can tear down, that you can get closer to the Lord. That's my prayer. We never pray or dismissal when someone's praying. So you're dismissed in Jesus' name. Hug each other, love on each other, go out and have a hamburger. Tell Keith how great of a job that he did. And come back Sunday. <laughs>